Okay, so here's how the story stands. You've seen the two sides now. We've repeated it from another, you know, we've, we've looked at it again and again and again from a number of angles because in a lot of cases the words are the same or the issues are the same, but they're all hub issues. So they have all of these ramifications. So now let's look at this. Here's the story. God sighed. If I don't pour myself into the thing, there's no good. The thing itself is not me, so it can't be good. Whatever good it can be is relative, depends on really other beings or things which are like of like weakness that can benefit from. Okay, like right now I'm lying on some pillows. Pillows don't do anything for God. Because I'm a human being who needs soft pillows, I'm going to call those pillows good to the extent that they do what I want them to do. All that's arbitrary and all that's subjective. Because you might not like the pillows the same way I do. That's going back to the shoes. Okay, but the, the deeper question, the deeper question is why did God make me such that I'd need pillows in the first place? Why am I so dependent on the existence of pillows? You see the point? This is where Satan's talking about the whole thing. I need pillows, I need food, I need shelter, I need water, I need air, I need sleep, I need clothing, I need money. I have all these needs. Angels don't have those needs. So God could have made me differently. And not only did he not make me differently, but there's this struggle due to sin to get the things I need. Adam didn't have polyester pillows. Adam didn't have a cell phone. Adam didn't have a computer. Adam didn't need these things. Christ didn't have those things either. So it's, I need it in my time for my lifestyle, but a whole bunch of people in the world don't have those things. So you have to ask yourself what needs are. See, even that's arbitrary. And do I get the things that I need or not? And why do I need them in the first place? And if I don't have what I need, how fair is that? So, the existence of a thing that God has to pour himself into everything in order to make good on it, Romans 8, 28, because nothing's doing anything for God, all these things would not exist if there wasn't a need for them. God had to create the need. There wouldn't be a polyester pillow if somebody didn't figure out how to make one. Well, where do you think that ability to figure it out came from? Now, theoretically speaking, anybody in the world today can get a polyester pillow. The one I'm laying on, I happen to have gotten at Walmart for $2. So it's not like they're terribly expensive. Of course, $2 is a lot of money in some parts of the world. I was on my way to the grocery checkout line. I thought, you know, I need a pillow. And there was one standing there in sort of a box, display box in the aisle. And I picked it up on my way to the grocery checkout line. You can argue I didn't actually need it, but I wanted to try it. Yeah, I'm real happy with it. Okay, well, how come that polyester pillow for $2 came to exist in the middle of the grocery aisle in the display box as I'm walking out? Don't you think God foreknew that? That's totally gratuitous. It's not doing anything for him. But I'm enjoying the pillow. So you got needs and then you got enjoyments which couldn't exist if the things didn't exist. And the things of themselves are really no good, especially not to God. 
So you see, everything that God creates is less than himself. And whatever God creates as less than himself is going to have needs for other things that are less than himself, especially the human. I'm not sure what other objects angels even need. They don't need to eat. They don't need to sleep. They sort of just ima- they just uh, I not imagine exactly, but they just think their way into any place they want to be. If an angel wants to be in Persia, he just says, "I'm I'm going to you know the king's palace in Persia." And the next second, he's there. He just thinks it, and it's so. Those are the kinds of powers angels have. So I don't know what things they need. But we certainly have a lot more needs than they do. Okay, God could have created us differently so those needs wouldn't exist, so he wouldn't have to bother with the hassle of creating or of creating the ability to create. You know, it's an ability to create a pillow. So he created the ability to create a pillow in somebody's mind or I wouldn't have this right now. So... The lower he makes, the lower he makes, the more things he needs to make to support the lower thing he made. So that's God's side of it. I'm going to make everything, and I have to put myself in everything and sustain it to make good on it. Just if I'm in it, that makes good on it because then God is in the lowest of the low, even hell. That's why imputing sins to Christ was so important. High law. Now because God is in the sin, Christ's humanity, the sins got into Christ's humanity, and Christ is also God. That creates a juridical occasion to make good on the event and the kind of good that God declares, just flat declares, is higher saved than a bunch of other things that are dividends on that salvation. Which is what Paul's getting at in 1 Corinthians 3. It's not just salvation. Salvation's a floor. There are lots of dividends on it. Yeah, because he created the first thing. So now he's got to create all these other things. And high, the heavenly state that we're told about, has basically a lot of the same things that are we see down here, except it's all nicer. And it looks like food is optional. And our bodies and our abilities will be higher than the angels. So all these things that we still end up having are for the lower Christians. Who didn't bother to learn him down here. It's optional for the higher people. They don't really need it and they don't really want it. But the lower ones need all the flash and dash. In order to learn something. That's why the kings own the kingdoms but themselves aren't really doing much. They have all kinds of staff for that. And everybody else is kind of like kingdoms down here. You don't think the queen does her own pictures, do you? She has a whole staff. It costs millions of dollars every year just to maintain all that stuff. And actually the queen doesn't even own that stuff anymore. That's owned by the state of of England. But used to be owned by the royal family. And it costs millions and millions and millions of dollars to keep up the china, to keep up the floors, to keep up the wallpaper, to keep up the pictures, to keep up the vases, so that the people who pay to tour Buckingham Palace or wherever every single year can see it. And they love doing that tour. They love paying the money to go to England, to walk through Buckingham Palace so they can say, I've been where the Queen has walked. See, that's how humans are. That's how weak we are. We like seeing baubles. And we're still like that in the eternal state. And God's providing for all of it. And he has to put himself in all of it. He has to maintain it. He has to organize it. He has to give everybody the ability to maintain it and organize it. So that the people can ooh and ah and stare. And he likes doing that. This is what kills me about God. How can you like going and and just, you're just throwing your life away on peasants? And I'm one of them. Except, no, well, see, I'm training you to be a king so you can learn to throw your, your life away the way I do. 
that's God's plan, baby. And it's all arbitrary. He just flat wants it this way. So it's this way. And here are the pluses and minuses of God's plan. Well, you get to know God, that's number one. But most people down here don't ever want to know God. They just want what they consider the baubles. They want the ooh and ah. They want to walk through Buckingham Palace and say that they saw the pretty vase or whatever because they equate their self-worth as higher because they went there. Oh, I got to shake hands with the queen. Hello? That's a real imposition on the queen, honey. She's got better things to do than shake hands, okay? But she's not supposed to allow herself to think that way. Yeah, and when you're a king, you're going to have to have lots of audiences with the peasants too. And they're going to make it the high point of their entire life that they got to see you once. Either in passing or actually walked into your throne room. Which you really don't even want. Because you have better things to do. And what you really want is for your populace to learn Christ. But you know what? They didn't want to learn Christ down here. So their ability to learn Christ post-death is hampered. Is small. And yeah, they'll be very, 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 very happy. As children are happy. And you got to live with that forever. Yeah, well, God's living with it now. Welcome to the club. This is his plan. This is how it works. This is your destiny. This is your future. You're either going to be a peasant going, ooh and ah, I got to walk through Buckingham Palace <clears throat> once in a millennium. Or you're going to be the one who's in charge that everybody wants to see. See what a drain that is? How can God want to live that life? I ask him that question every day. That's God's side of it. And that's what he wants you to prepare to be. And only when you go through that process do you see it through his eyes. Well, then you're not seeing him unless you go through the process. See that? This is the killer for me. Just the absolute killer. Okay, fine, but maybe you like it and you'll win where I lose. Good, I hope so. Because he's saying this is fulfilling. And he's the one who just flat makes it fulfilling. Because there's nothing innately fulfilling about it. There is nothing innately fulfilling about doing the dishes. But we're real glad when it's done. Why is that? Why are we glad to wash dishes? Or pee? Or get dressed? Because he just flat makes it fulfilling. It's not innately fulfilling to do those things. It's not. I'm sorry. You gotta breathe over and over, you gotta pee over and over, you gotta eat over and over, you gotta wash dishes over and over, you gotta put your clothes away over and over, you gotta write email over and over, you gotta back up your computer over and 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 over. The thing that's happy about that is you did what you were supposed to do and now it's done. Okay, but who made that rule that that's what the happiness is? God did. It's just because he flat declares it so that it's true. Because he made those needs in the first place. So he made, you know, answering needs or fulfilling needs or satisfying needs as being satisfaction. He just flat declared that to be true. That's God's side. Now let's go to Satan's side. Satan's side is, well, everything is huff and puff. And it's really the huffing and puffing you do that marks you out as a good person. That's where you, you know, all the good deeds emphasis is based on huff and puff. Oh, so-and-so gave a million dollars to charity. So-and-so is therefore a good person. That's Satan's mindset right there. The sacrifice you make means you're a good person. And therefore, you should be rewarded by society. Now, think about how stupid that is. If you're more capable than the society, such that you could give a million dollars to charity, what good is it to you if society, who is less than you, praises you? You 
You know, I talked about it in an earlier anchor and there was this June bug lying on its back as I'm walking out the door. And the June bug is flipped over on its back because its back is too heavy, its legs are too weak, and the poor thing was struggling in the air and I couldn't bear to see that. So I picked up a little bit of wood and I flipped it over on its on its legs. It actually grabbed the wood and I put it on the dirt. So the poor thing could walk and wouldn't have to be on its back. Now if the June bug actually had a conception of the fact that I was another living being and not just this big blur of color from my shirt, it would be pretty grateful that I did that. Okay? There's no benefit to me in its gratitude. There's no benefit to me if it decided to call up all the other June bugs and say, Hi, you know, here's this blur of color that we're going to call God, and we're all going to praise this blur of color because of the miracle it did for me. That's not going to do me any good. I am not going to be pleased by that. I'm not going to be impressed by that. It's not going to make me feel good about myself. You know what the pleasure was for me in helping that June bug? Imagining how the June bug is feeling better. The June bug's own, what do you want to call it, comfort. That's what the rush was for me. That was what was in it for me to do it for the June bug. I imagined myself being in the June bug's place and I didn't want, I, I just imagined, I thought, oh, the poor thing is hurting. And it pleased me to turn it over on its legs so it wouldn't be hurting anymore. That made me feel good. The June bug went up and drew up a, you know, worship brain out committee. That would not make me feel good. If it dedicated buildings in my name for what I did for it, that would not make me feel good. So why would it make you feel good that a whole bunch of people who are less than you praise you for giving a million dollars to charity or whatever the heck it was you did that they thought they should praise you for? Where's the, where's the thrill in that? None. It's hallucinated. Because if somebody less than you is praising you, that's no credit to you. It only becomes a credit, and even then only fleetingly, if the person praising you is as good as or better than you. Okay, well, if you're king over the others, you're better than them. Maybe not innately, but at least in status. So their praise to you is not fulfilling. Satan imagines and hallucinates that it is fulfilling. Because he hallucinates that if he beats God... He's going to love being king of the mountain. He won't. Because God is already king of the mountain. And look what he does with it. He throws himself down on behalf of the creation he makes. And he even creates creation too low. So he has to work harder. And create all these other things for the creation that he makes. Because the creation that he made, he made weak. Why did he do it that way? The praise from weak creation isn't doing anything for God, okay? We need to praise Him. He doesn't need our praise. Now there's a sentence that you say at the Haggadah, which is the Passover Seder. Um, the, pray, the, pray, the praise to God is always becoming. Praise will always be becoming. I'm not saying it right because I haven't celebrated Seder in a long time. Years. Okay. Praise will always be becoming the God. Well, yeah, but God isn't benefiting from it. And the, the, the thing that chaps me about Judaism is they think, well, if we praise God, we're doing a good deed, so God should credit us, and we're righteous if we do a good deed. No, you're not doing anything for God if you do something good. You might be doing something good for yourself, and you might be actually enjoying it. But God doesn't need your good deeds. And to the extent that you argue that he should or should reward you for your good deeds, you hate him. And you have absolutely no understanding of godness at all. Satan is the one who wants you to praise him. Satan is the one who wants you doing the good deeds. 
because Satan's the one hallucinating that if lesser creatures than himself are busy praising him, that means he's somebody. Is that stupid or what? That's like the June bugs praising me. That's not making me a better person. Their opinion of me does not make me anything. And if anything, I don't want to pay any attention to them. Oh, all the June bugs are going to have a little revival meeting to praise brain out. Oh, yeah, okay. Any politician will tell you one of the things he can't stand doing the most is having to go out on the parade route and kiss babies and shake hands. Oh, here's Mrs. McGillicuddy with her too strong perfume and her slobbering kid that I have to pick up now and kiss the baby and I'm going to get all this baby slobber on my face for a photo opportunity. In order to get Mrs. McGillicuddy's vote and everybody who's like Mrs. McGillicuddy, which is like 40% of the U.S. population. I mean, come on. But Satan, who also hates kissing babies and walking on the prey route, he somehow magically thinks that if he gets the whole, which he despises, by the way, he gets the whole approval of the world, that makes him win over God. And, of course, he hates us, too. But he actually thinks that that proves him better. So that's how people think down here. This is Satan's side of it. I do my good works versus your good works, and I did more good works than you did. You put five dollars in the collection plate, but I put in a hundred. So I'm more important than you. I'm better than you. I get more credit than you. You know, people kill themselves over this stuff. That's Satan's righteousness. That's Satan's idea of righteousness and good deeds. Now, which is better? Well, you know what? Neither one. You didn't expect me to give you that answer, did you? But think about it. Either way, Satan's plan or God, you're wasting yourself. Do you think about that? You go God's plan. Well, okay, I'm being trained to be a king. Yeah, and what is kingship? Kingship is where you throw yourself away on your kingdom, spending oodles and oodles of your time forever on those who are insufferably lower than you doing childish things, like parenting. So you, your happiness in doing that is the happiness of your kids. My happiness in turning over that June bug was my imagination. It is my imagination. But it's my imagination at my level of the enjoyment to the June bug because it's not suffering anymore. In other words, how much did the June bug actually suffer by being on its back? I'm not God, so I don't know. But you can imagine that it's a bug's mind, so it's not a whole lot of suffering compared to mine. I was suffering more than the June bug was suffering by watching it be on its back. It bothered me. So much that I put the little thing of wood so it could grab on the wood and I flipped it over on the dirt. It bothered me that much. How much did it actually bother the June bug? Well, its brain is less than the size of a grain of sand. So not a whole lot. There's no soul in the June bug. So it's just a bundle of, you know, what do you want to call it? Instincts. And the thing doesn't live. You know, that's why it's called a June bug. So whatever it did or didn't do in its short little life, it's going to be over soon. And then it was as if it was never there. So who, who's who got the memory of it and who's the bigger entity? Well, me. Junebug might be dead by now. Of course, it's not June yet. I'm making this recording on what, May 10th. I'll be posting it later. Junebug will be dead very shortly. Could be dead already now because somebody ate it. So whose pleasure and whose pain is really the issue here? My own. God made me. He watches me. Whose pleasure and whose pain is really the issue? God's own. Not mine. I'm just a Junebug to him. 
I mean, that's not the way he thinks of me, but comparatively, I'm of no more value than a June bug. Okay, but he doesn't think that way. He cares about how I feel. Certain of my feelings, well, they have to stay bad because of the whatever value he's baptizing onto those bad feelings to make good on them by his own definition. But it's really his own value. Okay, so he's wasting himself on me like I wasted myself on that June bug. Only his wasting himself is way higher. For the sake of what? For the sake of his own pleasure about my own pleasure. And so this is the thing that always, you know, chaps me about God. There's a Greek word that always drives me nuts. Eudokia. God's good pleasure. It doesn't really mean good pleasure. It means good estimation. Dokimazo is a, an, an analysis, analytical, an analytical form of thinking. It's used in Romans 12 too. For the purpose of testing you, in, in you know, for your genuineness. That's an analytical test. It's an analytical thinking. It's often translated judge. Okay? God is thinking. He's looking at you, at me, at everything, and he's got his own pleasure in what he sees. His own estimation and judgment about our suffering or pleasure that he sees. I was looking at the June bug. The June bug was probably barely aware of any pain, but my pain was greater than the June bugs, and that's why I did something about it. It seemed unjust. I was judging. It was unjust for me, who sees the June bug helpless, to let it stay that way. I got a great deal of pleasure out of turning it over. The June bug is probably, you know, in truth, unaware of what happened to it. It's probably confused if it even remembers, which it probably doesn't. So my estimation of its suffering was the suffering. It was my suffering at watching it. And I want to do something about that weakness. It by itself was weak. It's not doing anything for me. I did something for it. But I'm, I'm satisfied by it. So it doesn't owe me anything. I did something to it that satisfied me. See the point? I'm wasting myself on the June bug. Yes, I wasted whatever it was, five minutes. That could have done something else. That was more noble. I wasted it on the June bug. Junebug itself was totally weak. Junebug itself was totally helpless. Junebug itself was not aware of me at all. Couldn't have done anything for me at all. And when I flipped it over and inside, I enjoyed that. And I flipped it so it could walk. I really enjoyed that. And pouring myself, therefore, into the Junebug. For those five minutes. And I enjoyed doing it. This is how it is with God. This is how it is with kingship. This is how it's supposed to be in the future state. This is what the kings do. They enjoy doing this. Like helping the June bug. That's your life. On the God side. You're making yourself essentially. You know putting yourself down at. The level of. The low. That's Greek verb typeno. It's in Philippians 2, 5 through 10. Because you enjoy doing it. Now Satan imagines himself to be doing the same thing. Except that his ideas are like, I don't know, weird. Because on the one hand, he this is why I say he didn't complete in maturity. 
And most theologians kind of figured that out, so it's not just by now saying it. It's very common knowledge, or should be. On the one hand, Satan, his whole being is messianic, which you can understand why it would be, because that's really what God's all about. He loves saving, just like I love saving the June bug. God loves doing that to everything. That's his big thrill in life. He loves saving, he loves rescuing, he loves creating and making good on pouring himself into. Now Satan imagines himself to do the same thing, but he also hates it. He also despises it. That's why he didn't complete the love and that's a problem we humans have to and that's frankly a problem I'm, I've got. Why am I wasting my time but yet I'll turn over a June bug so why am I complaining about the other things I got to do? This is dumb. I enjoyed that. So why wouldn't I enjoy all things? Because everything, you know, everything that's less than a human, you got to wash your body. Well, your body's less than you. You got to do it over and over and over again. Sometimes it's enjoyable, sometimes it's not. Depends on what you're thinking about it at the time. Whether you're annoyed that you have to do it or whether you like doing it. Of course, it depends on how you do it and why you do it. God loves rescuing everything. God loves making good on everything. God loves touching everything. Satan doesn't. Satan likes telling himself what a martyr he is. And he wants everybody else to think the same way. And pretty much we do. When you do a good deed for somebody, your typical human being, when he actually does a real good deed for someone else, he prides himself on it. That's his reward to him. That's why good deeds are so bad. You're basically saying that the good deed itself, there's no compensating value in nature to the deed that you did. That, that in order to get compensation from the good deed you did, you got to pride yourself on what you did. And the rest of the human race agrees with that. They praise you. And because your self is being praised, you're stupid enough to think that that praise has value and is correct. Because you want to believe it's correct. Because to you, pride is compensation. Oh, Brain Out's a good person. Brain Out did this thing. Yeah, and if Brain Out lets the pride stupidity take hold, which is all smoke and mirrors, honey, the brain out is going to be ruled, run by the nose, by the people who praised brain out. Satan is run by the nose because he deems himself a martyr, and that's his compensation for doing the good he imagines himself to do. See the difference? With God, it's all about empathy for the object. He wants to pour himself out for the object, for the sake of the object. That really matters to him. That's the love of God. It, it's it's just the act of doing it. It's not about the root. It's not how do I even put this. It was a thrill to make the June bug able to walk again, just because it was. I didn't need anything from the June bug to compensate me for what I did. I enjoyed doing it. I just flat enjoyed it. Just like I would enjoy a good meal, just like I'd enjoy a good movie, just like I'd enjoy peanut butter. Or any of my favorite activities. God does it because he enjoys it. Eudokia. His good pleasure. That's based on an analysis, based on a judgment. And obviously subjective. Satan, by contrast, likes to pride himself on what he's giving up. Likes to pride himself on what it costs him. So he didn't grow up in love. He's not doing what he does out of sheer enjoyment for its own sake. He's doing it because it buttresses his ego. And that's why all the praise from other angels or, he, or people gets to him. 
and he hates it at the same time because we're all you know lower yeah see the problem with buttressing your ego is is that you always have to you uh, if you're going to buttress your ego you have to say that you're better or good if you're going to say that you're good you have to say that you're better than somebody else in order to call yourself good okay but if that's somebody else you're better than praises you then their praise doesn't mean anything there's no value to the price because they're not on your level. But see, if you have to buttress your ego, you can't, eventually, you can't afford to have anybody be at your level. Otherwise, you're not good. See, it's a circular reasoning that ends up falling flat on its face. And worst of all, you're all alone. You have to convince yourself that being all alone and being top dog is the most wonderful thing in life. Well, how is that wonderful? You got nothing to nobody to share it with. Everybody else is too low, and you have to disdain them in order to call yourself good. And so, what good is their praise? And frankly, we see lots and lots and lots of parallels in this life. A famous movie that really illustrated this the best was Scarface with Al Pacino. That was a guy who wanted to get money and fame in order to feel good about himself and he finally got it and of course he got it the wrong way and he wasn't happy and he had to keep on telling himself you know I'm, I, what was it Tony Montano was his name the character he had to keep telling himself well I'm high I'm good blah 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 I'll shoot everybody else and the girl that he wanted he didn't enjoy she didn't enjoy him either all the money that he got and his, you know, his fancy cars and his fancy houses and all the fancy jewelry, that didn't make him happy. And and then the one thing that he cared about was his sister. And then he got all upset about his sister, you know, falling in love with one of his lieutenants. And she ends up dying and that just does it for him. But the whole time she was alive... He wasn't treating her well either. It's just, she's my sister. Yeah, but he isn't actually treating her very well. So he doesn't know how to love. Same thing in the Godfather movies. It's all about, oh, we're top dog, we're going to beat the other, you know, Godfather gangs. Okay, fine, you did that. Now what? Nothing. Everybody's living on this hallucination. Oh, this fight will make us be number one. Okay, fine. You get to number one, and where are you? All alone. Unable to love. Unable to enjoy. You have to despise everything beneath you. And you have this burden now of really having to take care of everybody beneath you. And you hate it. All because you're basing your entire argument about good and bad on priding the self for being a martyr. On what others think of you. On a definition of good and bad that is fundamentally false. Because you're trying to claim that things can make you a better person. If I own this house, if I own this jewelry, if I own this car, if I own this person, I must be superior. Okay, but those things aren't anything. They don't make you better. And if you're trying to claim they are, you're claiming that an inanimate thing or a lower thing is making up you higher. Hello? How can the lower make higher? If the lower can make higher, then the lower really is higher. So you're not higher. See this, the stupidity of all this? If people praise me and that makes me a good person, then the people that are praising me are better than me. Because I'm saying that their praise makes me higher, makes me good, validates my goodness. Well, then they have to be better than me and I'm not really good after all. You see, it's the circular insanity. And the whole world lives based on this. Everything in life revolves around whether people praise you. And then you call yourself good because everybody else says you are. 
Okay, but then you're not good because if it takes those others to say you are, then they're actually better than you. So you're not as good as you claim. And they don't actually know you anyhow. So the praise of others for your martyrdom doesn't mean you sacrificed anything either. And if it meant that you were good, then they're still better than you and you didn't sacrifice anything after all. You see the point? They're either better than you or they're not. If they're not better than you, their praise means nothing. If they are better than you, then you didn't actually accomplish anything. Because the whole idea is, oh, I have to be better than them. I have to be the martyr. I have to give up for somebody else, yada, yada. And now I'm good. And now what? where's the grand prize? None. So you wasted yourself in Satan's plan too. God's constantly wasting himself on us just like turning over the June bug. He likes doing it just because. It's not to get anything. He just likes the activity. Practicing righteousness. Just because he enjoys it. And he's defining what practicing is. And he's defining what righteousness is. They're all his definitions. And he just enjoys doing it because he enjoys it. And he is wasting himself. And he will just keep on doing it because he just loves doing it. And Satan considers that to be quite masochistic. And Satan's right. Okay, but Satan's a masochist too. And what is he wasting himself for? Oh, because if I beat God, then I'm top dog of the mountain. And somehow that's going to be fulfilling to me. Really? It's not fulfilling to God. He's already top dog. And if you be God and you're king of the mountain, then everybody else is lower than you, including God. So where's your happiness going to come from then? Because the praise of the lesser doesn't, how do you want to call it? If they're less than you and they praise you, then they don't know what they're talking about. And their praise isn't worth anything to you. The June bug's praise is not worth anything to me. If it makes the June bug feel good, I'm happy about that. But other than that, I don't need it at all. And Satan is now wasting himself and the whole rest of the world following him on all these hallucinated ideas about the lesser aggregate praise and this so-called noble fight where his only compensation is to pride himself on how good he is for going through it. And that's how the human race is, too. You get to the end of your life and you did all those good deeds, baby. And what did it buy you? Praise from what? People who wanted something from you, who wanted the goodies from you. They wanted you to do those good deeds, and yeah, you did them over and over again. And they just led you by the nose to do all that, those good deeds, do all that hard work. And, you know, they think about you five minutes on Sunday or they put your name on top of a building or they create a chair in a university with your name on it because you gave so much money. But that's the only time they think of you. And it's like for five minutes and they go back to Johnny and the dry cleaners. And you gave up your life for that? Yep, you're a martyr, all right. So who's the real masochist? And what's the value of being a masochist? You waste yourself in God's plan or you waste yourself in Satan's plan? Take your pick.